Junior Seau's family wants researchers to look at his brain to check if he suffered damage from injuries sustained during his 20 years in the NFL. Seau committed suicide this week. We'll talk about his legacy to the game and the community. And federal agents abandoned him in a windowless jail cell without food or water for five days. Now UC San Diego engineering student Daniel Chong is suing the federal government. My guests today are North County Times columnist Jay Paris and UT San Diego reporter Reporter Jeff McDonald. Jay, you knew Junior Seau. What was he like as a player? What was he like as a person? And what kind of mark does he leave on San Diego? Well, I think he was uh, really the same as a player and a person, and you would describe that with passion. And he played the game with incredible passion, and he really lived his life with that same passion. And uh, the legacy he leaves is he was a Hall of Fame player and one of the best ever to play the game overall and certainly one of the best Chargers. But almost a legacy too, it was his connection to the fans, his connection to the community, uh, who, the work he did in that community. More than $4 million in college scholarships to kids, throwing open his restaurant every Thanksgiving to feed the needy, uh, shop, shop with the jock where he would give kids 100 bucks to shop for their family. So he was such a, a force on the field, but really that force was, was uh, was almost trumped off the field. And I think that's where the real, the, real, the real loss is here, that people felt like they knew Junior Seau. He grew up in Oceanside. He went to school up the road at USC, and he was a star, a big star for their Chargers. And it's a loss that's going to be uh, felt for some, quite some time. People who saw him this week said that he was in great spirits Monday um, at a celebrity golf tournament. Tuesday, he canceled in afternoon shoot, saying that he wasn't feeling well. Wednesday, he takes his own life. Were there any signs, any indications that he was depressed about something? We can't uncover any, and, and uh, you look at the finances too, and there weren't, you know, there weren't people knocking on the door looking for money, and, and you, it, you know, Junior was always the brightest personality in, in every room he walked into, and uh, for him to cancel a, a photo shoot, I don't know what was going on there, but, you know, he had appointments later that day, you know, his, his mom said, you know, why, why wouldn't she, he say anything to her? And it seemed like it was almost a, you know, I've heard it described as a, a permanent solution to a temporary problem. That you wonder what his state of mind is, and maybe that goes into playing 20 years in the NFL as well. Well, so he plays 20 years in right. the NFL, which is unheard of. Mm -hmm. Now his family says that they want his brain studied for possible signs of uh, traumatic brain encephalopathy, which is associated with depression, occasional suicide, even dementia. Right. Did he ever talk about this publicly? Did he ever show any signs of suffering from something like this? Absolutely not. And uh, Junior, part of his, what made him Junior Seau was his toughness and his machoism. And, you know, he would, he would never raise a hand and say, I need, I need a playoff here, coach. You know, I, I saw the guy play on one leg one time. No way he should have been playing. His knee was shot. He had more tackles than anybody out there. And I think, too, with, with the concussion and, you know, that's the whole mentality and culture of the National Football League is how tough can you be? Everybody gets hurt. Can you go through that pain? And I think when you combine that with the, the proud Samoan, Samoan culture, which is a warrior mentality and a warrior culture, you know, they don't, they don't raise their hand and say, I'm hurting here. And uh, did Junior say I'll have concussions during his career? Absolutely. I mean, he played in one of the most violent positions you could on the field and was uh, making contact on every play. And, uh, of course, he suffered those concussions. He never let on them. Well, let's talk about the game of football. It has become, it's just not your father's football right. game. It's become faster, harder, it's more rough. This week, 100 former NFL players joined other 1,500, I think, retired players in suing the NFL, saying that they're still experiencing debilitating effects from injuries they suffered to the brain on the field. How seriously is the NFL taking these concerns? As serious as a $9 billion company would. And they're, they're scared to death because more and more of these players are coming back and saying, you know, we didn't get the proper medical care. Uh, there wasn't an objective observer, a neuro neurologist or somebody that could maybe look at it. It's hard to rely on the team trainer, the team doctor to say, this guy can't play anymore. Everybody wants to win. Winning means money and everybody wants that. So they're saying, you know, as we go on, we didn't have that information. And you're right about the game. And a lot of it's the equipment. I mean, these light helmets, and they're using their helmets as a weapon, where in years past they didn't do that as much. And it's bigger, stronger size, and the, the, it's just the force of the velocity. The hits are becoming that much more violent. On the other end, 
That's what sells. That's why people tune in. That's why it's a $9 billion industry. So the NFL is, is in a real juggling act, but they are trying to put in rules to, to, to promote safety as much as they can. We're going to switch gears now, Jeff. So there's this case of the UCSD engineering student, Daniel Chong, who's left in a jail cell for five days without food or water. Let's take, a, take this case back a little bit. He was first picked up during a drug raid at a private home. What was he doing there? Uh, by his own admission and the DEA, he was there to party with his friends on a Friday night, uh, April 20th. Uh, he spent the night, and uh, unbeknownst to him and certainly the other occupants of the house, the DEA had been observing the home for some time and had secured a search warrant, which they executed that Saturday. Uh, they grabbed up nine people, including Mr. Chong, and uh, took them to the DEA administration headquarters in Kearney Mesa. Um, what happened next is not clear. Uh, the DEA has said that uh, they went through the process of interviewing all nine people, transferring folks from holding cells to interview rooms uh, so they could be separately questioned independently, uh, individually, I should say. Uh, they lost track of Mr. Chong at a point after, uh, at some point after the interview, they concluded his discussion and determined that he wasn't uh, guilty of any crime, that they told him he would be released and that uh, just sit tight, we're going to let you go. In fact, Mr. Chong says that one agent said he'd even give him a ride home. This would have been Saturday afternoon sometime. Um, Meantime, seven folks uh, were, seven of the people were transferred to county custody. One was released, and Mr. Chong was the one they forgot about. Uh, when he went back into the cell on the Saturday after the interview, uh, he expected to go home within an hour, two hours, whatever, and he hung tight, and uh, apparently he was handcuffed. Uh, the door never opened again until Wednesday uh, afternoon. So he's in this cell for five days. What did he endure, and what did he do to keep himself alive? Uh, well, uh, he told a very harrowing tale at his press conference on Tuesday. Uh, he expected to go home. He endured, uh, you know, he was hungry. He had no water. Uh, he had no place to go to the bathroom. Uh, he was handcuffed. Uh, when it became apparent that he wasn't going home anytime soon, uh, he said mental fatigue set in. Uh, he started hallucinating from lack of food and water. Uh, at some point, uh, well, he also could hear voices and footsteps outside the door, and he couldn't understand why no one was responding to his screams and his kicks. And uh, uh, he described uh, basically going crazy and insane. How was he eventually discovered? That remains a mystery. Uh, he says uh, he assumes it was accidental. Someone just walked in. Uh, he also said, however, that one of the agents said, here's the water you've been asking for, which I think is a very significant memory. Uh, remembrance because it implies that the agents knew he was in there. Uh, the DEA understandably hasn't responded to the specific uh, points that Mr. Chong has brought forward. Uh, he subsequently filed a claim against the agency and will be going to court uh, to recover damages. Uh, he was immediately transported to a local hospital where he spent three days in intensive care. What kind of condition was he in? Uh, severely dehydrated, malnourished, uh, and he reported having a perf perforated lung from having ingested glass from his eyeglasses in a um, ill-fated suicide attempt. So the DEA has acknowledged that this has happened. They have apologized to him. Have they explained anything? Have they given any, any hint as to how something like this has happened? I mean, as far as we know, it hasn't happened before. No, as far as we know, nothing like this has happened before. Uh, the only thing they've really acknowledged beyond the apology was that it was accidental. That was a key word in their statement to us on Monday, and we went with that. Uh, we've been pressing them for follow-up questions and responses to his side of the story, and none has been forthcoming. Um, perhaps understandably, in light of the $20 million claim his lawyer filed on Wednesday. So his lawyer has sued. He's seeking $20 million. What is his lawyer saying about this case? Uh, well, they liken it to torture. Uh, they cite a number of, uh, of examples of, of his condition that uh, meet that statute. Uh, he, uh, th they recount in the, in the five-page claim. Uh, the other law, the laws that dictate what the government can and can't do, and the violations that the government is alleged to have committed against uh, Mr. Chong, and uh, that will presumably be rejected by the DEA counsel, and uh, go to court sometime later this year, next year. He asked for an expedited uh, 
uh, rejection of the claim, which he uh, expects. And we'll close it there. Jeff, Jay, thank, thank you for you. speaking to us today. Thank you.